Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions, and we start with question number one from Jackson Carlaw. Uh, can I thank colleagues from across the chamber for their well-intentioned advice freely given on what I should do now? And for the anecdotes many have offered with the caveat that they were never quite brave enough to speak them themselves, but thought that I might like to have a try, I'll probably pass on that. And presiding officer, may I begin by stating what a privilege uh, and delight it is to stand here as the first man in 13 years to face the First Minister at uh, questions on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. And I hope that in communities all across Scotland, everybody will see that there is indeed no glass ceiling for ambition in the Scottish Conservatives. They too, <laughs> they too can aspire to lead, if only temporarily. Um, first Minister, I look forward to our weekly exchange of pleasantries over the next few months. I do so fully respecting the office of First Minister, but also because and this is a failure of character on my part, which my party can scarcely forgive, let alone understand. I actually quite like the First Minister. Oh. However, I am sure, I am sure neither of us will allow this weakness on my part to stand in the way of robust exchange, and so to business. First Minister, just how badly let down have the thousands of Scottish women fitted with a mesh device been? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, begin by welcoming Jackson Carlaw to his uh, temporary place, uh, asking these questions. And let me say at the outset, I'm very proud to be the last woman standing uh, at First Minister's <laughs> questions. Um, I'm not sure if I'm expected to reciprocate all of the nice things that Jackson Carlaw said to me at this stage, so I'll maybe just uh, gloss over that uh, for the moment. Uh, can I turn to uh, the substance of Jackson Carlaw's question, because it's an important one. I know it's one, uh, a subject that he has taken a very uh, close interest in over a period of time. Uh, in, in terms of the women affected, I have uh, deep uh, and very profound sympathy for what they have gone through and for the position that they have found themselves in. I can't begin to imagine uh, the pain and suffering that many of them have experienced. Uh, that's why, of course, the Scottish Government has acted through setting up of uh, the review and further work that has flowed from that review. And, of course, in her uh, first few weeks as Health Secretary, uh, Jean Freeman uh, announced uh, what is effectively uh, a ban, a temporary halt for all mesh procedures uh, and that will be lifted only when a new restricted use protocol is put in place uh, and that will ensure that procedures are only carried out in future in the most exceptional of circumstances and of course subject to a very robust process of approval and fully informed consent. Uh, I wasn't in the chamber for the Health Secretary's statement, but I, I did hear some of it and on uh, that occasion, indeed, I think I heard Jackson Carlow uh, welcoming the action that the Health Secretary had taken and I hope he will do so again today. Jackson Carlow. Um, this has surely been the greatest self-inflicted health scandal since thalidomide in the 1960s. And across this chamber sit MSPs who have led with determination to expose it as such, in particular, Alec Neil, Neil Finlay, Rona Mackay, Angus Macdonald and Joanne Lamont. And in the gallery today are women who many regard as outstanding examples of leadership and courage. Elaine Holmes, who led the public petitions process in MESH, Marion Scott, the journalist who led so successfully and campaigned in the issue, and many other MESH survivors who are watching today's exchanges at home. To me, they are heroes, recognised as such across Scotland, the UK and internationally, for all they have achieved. And they deserve the congratulations and the appreciation of every one of us for everything that they have done. First Minister, during our October recess, the Australian government issued a full and formal apology to all those whose lives have been compromised by MESH. Here is part of what that apology said. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the Australian government, I say sorry to all of those women with the historic agony and pain that has come from MESH implementation, which have led to horrific outcomes. Will the First Minister now follow suit and on behalf of the Scottish government today match that apology to all the women in Scotland who have suffered? First Minister. Can I, can I say, firstly, I have expressed apology uh, previously uh, to the women who have suffered. I know the previous Health Secretary, uh, Shona Robinson, has done so and Jean Freeman has also done so. But for the avoidance of any uh, doubt and without any equivocation, let me say today, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I apologise unreservedly 
to any woman who has uh, suffered because of MESH procedures. Uh, the Scottish Government has uh, acted here. I know Jackson Carlow, because of his interest in this, is aware uh, that medical devices across the UK are regulated by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Uh, that is a reserved body. The Scottish Government, therefore, cannot totally ban MESH. But the actions we have taken, for example, the suspension of the use of mesh uh, in 2014 led to a significant reduction in the use of mesh uh, implants and the further action that Jean Freeman announced uh, some weeks ago uh, to temporarily halt uh, procedures until we put in place a new restricted use protocol uh, is the right action. And again, I hope members who have campaigned on this across the chamber will welcome that today. Jackson Carlow. Thank you for that. And on the MHRA, I have, I have indicated that Scottish Conservatives will support a representation to the UK Government on that issue. Uh, because this isn't really a question of whether a process is devolved or reserved. It's about a process which has failed. And we have to ensure that such an incident doesn't happen again in the future. Exposing MESH has not been a party political initiative. And with that said, the singular serious misstep in the Scottish Government's record on this issue was its response to the now widely discredited review into MESH regarded by women affected and key clinicians such as Wayle Agar as a whitewash. Indeed, nearly 100 MSPs signed a charter to that effect in Parliament. Now, at the time, the First Minister and Health Secretary invited Professor Alison Britton to report on the process, but not the findings of that review, which they said would stand. In the event, as the First Minister indicated, the new Health Secretary abandoned that position with a robust and welcome intervention last month. Now, Professor Britton's report is now complete. There is no first nor second draft amended by any self-interested third party. There is just her unvarnished report. It is now, or will imminently, be in the hands of ministers. Will the First Minister agree today both to publish Professor Britton's report without delay and also to say now that she expects, at least, to accept its findings and implement the recommendations made in it in full? First Minister. And I will come to all of them. In terms of the MHRA, I welcome Jackson Carlaw's uh, offer to help put pressure on the MHRA. The Scottish Government, of course, has already raised these concerns, and I would certainly look forward to hearing what uh, the Scottish Conservatives uh, are going to do to add their voice to the calls that we have already made. Um, yes, I would agree with Jackson Carlaw that uh, what is most important here is this is a procedure that has failed. But of course, it is uh, relevant, uh, whether it is a devolved or reserved matter, in terms of what the Scottish Government is able to do. And that's why I think it is legitimate to point to the fact that the MHRA is a, a reserved body. In terms of uh, the review, I think it's important firstly to say that the review findings were uh, similar uh, to those in recent reviews uh, that were carried out in uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, England and in some countries across the European Union. However, Professor Alison Britton uh, was asked to review the process of the independent review. I understand ministers uh, have only just received that report and it is our intention uh, to publish that report uh, and of course to accept and implement uh, the recommendations or where we think they are not appropriate to set out very clearly to Parliament why that is the case and allow Parliament to form its own conclusions on that. We are determined to do everything uh, we can to recognise the suffering that has been experienced by women, but more importantly, to ensure that this suffering is not repeated by other women in future. It has been a cross-party campaign and I hope it will continue in that vein. Jackson Carla. I thank the First Minister for everything she has said there. For the women concerned, uh, an apology, and the First Minister has offered one, is a necessary cathartic act. However, small and practical actions can also make a significant uh, change to their lives now. For example, responsibility for the Blue Badge Scheme rests with the Scottish Government. However, many of the women whose mobility has been impaired by MESH are currently simply not eligible. To them, access to the Blue Badge Scheme those in wheelchairs and on crutches, would be a hugely welcome and practical advantage. Now, this may not be the biggest political ask of the day, but it is an important issue to the women involved, and we could resolve to do something about it now. So will the First Minister agree today to instruct ministers and officials to review access to the Blue Badge Scheme, to offer those who have seen their mobility severely impaired by MESH the singular and practical improvement to their future lives and well-being? Well, I've got a lot of sympathy uh, with the points that Jackson Carlaw has made there. Yes, I will ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security to work with her officials to look at what action can be taken. I uh, would think, although uh, I don't want to uh, at this stage uh, give 
Parliament assurances that I don't know whether we can deliver on quickly, but I would think this is not necessarily a particularly complicated uh, issue. Local authorities, of course, when it comes to blue badges, uh, will be relevant in these discussions as well. But I'm sure uh, the Social Security uh, Cabinet Secretary would be happy to talk to Jackson Carlow about how uh, we can take this forward once we've had an opportunity to have officials look at it in more detail. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's Audit Scotland report is a damning indictment of this government's mismanagement of our National Health Service. It says, and I quote, the NHS in Scotland is not in a financially sustainable position and performance against national targets is declining. And it is not the only report that has raised alarming concerns about Scottish government health spending. A paper by Professor John McLaren of Glasgow University points to a future £400 million gap between what the Scottish Government plans to spend on the NHS each year and what it actually needs to spend on the NHS each year. First Minister, are the Auditor General and Professor John McLaren wrong? First Minister. Well, let me come on to John McLaren later. Can I first of all deal with Audit Scotland and I'll take each of uh, Richard Lennon's points in turn. Uh, the Audit Scotland uh, report published this morning is rightly blunt. It sets out the challenges that the NHS is facing. In that sense, of course, it doesn't tell us uh, what we don't already know or are not already working to address. The challenges our National Health Service are facing are the same challenges as the National Health Service is facing in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and indeed the same challenges that health services are facing across much of the world. The Auditor General herself uh, recognises that those challenges come from uh, demands on the service uh, from the ageing population uh, growing. Uh, of course, the task for us is not just to describe the challenge. The task for us is to come up with the solutions, and that is exactly what the Scottish Government is doing. We have plans in place both for the investment the health service needs and for the reform that the health service needs. Now, in terms of the uh, comment about financial sustainability, as the Audit Scotland report itself recognises, and this is not a criticism of Audit Scotland because, uh, of course, the medium term financial, perhaps Liberal members would like to listen to, to this, it is important. The medium term financial plan that the health secretary published in this chamber just before the October recess is not taken account of uh, in the Audit Scotland report. And of course, uh, that plan sets out uh, a proposal to see the health budget increase uh, by £3.3 billion uh, over the period until 2023. Uh, that would be annual growth of 2.9% in real terms. And as Audit Scotland report says, the Fraser of Allender Institute predicts that the health resource budget is likely to have to increase by around 2% per year uh, to stand still. So we are providing resources over and above that. And I think that significantly changes uh, the comment about financial sustainability. Uh, my last point on that, of course, is the Auditor uh, General in the report is clear that it's current models of delivery that are not sustainable. That's why the reforms we are carrying out are so important as well. Uh, finally and briefly, let me turn to the John McLaren uh, comments from last week. Uh, and there, there, are, uh, there are two criticisms made there, the, uh, and on both of them we would actually dispute the basis on which they are made. The first is that uh, our estimate of the demand, increased demand for health services is too low. Uh, actually, our estimate is in line with many of the independent estimates. We estimate uh, total rising demand of 4%. Uh, that's in line uh, with Fraser of Allender. In fact, it's slightly higher than what Fraser of Allender have recommended. Uh, also, the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, and indeed the King's uh, Fund, the Nuffield Trust and the Health Foundation in a letter to the Prime Minister. So I would take issue with that. Uh, and secondly, uh, John McLaren suggests that our estimate for savings that the health service can make uh, are too high. Uh, but actually, they are consistent with past performance and are actually lower than the savings uh, requirements being expected in England. Uh, so those are uh, my views on uh, the John McLaren report. But in summary, presiding officer, our health service does face challenges, but we are the only administration anywhere in the UK that has clear and robust plans in place to address and overcome these challenges. Richard Leonard. The NHS in Scotland is not in a financially sustainable position. That's in today's uh, Audit Commission report. The First Minister can talk about her government's budget choices, but her budget choices 
forced health boards across Scotland to make £449 million pounds worth of cuts in the last financial year alone. And the government calls these efficiency savings, but let's be clear, these are cuts. And these cuts have increased year on year since Nicola Sturgeon became First Minister. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber how much local health boards have had to cut since she took office? First Minister. Health boards are not facing cuts. Health spending has increased year on year. And if if Richard Leonard wants to talk, uh, as he's right to do, about the Audit Scotland report, he has to recognise that the Audit Scotland report today says that over the past 10 years, the health debt budget has increased in real terms, over and above inflation, by 7.7%. .7%. That's not cuts. That is rising uh, health budgets. Uh, secondly, in terms of the point about financial uh, sustainability, I know, I know the uh, Audit, uh, Audit Scotland have corrected their online version of the report uh, this morning, uh, but more substantively, and I, I think that this is just a statement of fact, uh, the report due to the recent publication of the medium term financial plan uh, that is not taken account of in the plan and that sets out plans to increase health spending by 3.3 billion pounds between now and 2023 which is over and above what the fraser of allender institute uh, commented on by audit scotland say is needed uh, to deal with the inflationary pressure so we have put in plan a uh, place the plans to build on current record funding in the health service to make sure that it is financially sustainable in the future. Uh, and my final point on this, uh, presiding officer, uh, if we had followed uh, Labour's spending plans from the last yeah. Scottish election, yeah. from the last Scottish election, if we'd followed what they uh, said in their own manifesto, uh, the NHS today would be, and Labour perhaps should listen to this, if we'd uh, followed those plans, our NHS today would be £360 million worse off than it is. That's the equivalent of the NHS losing 9,000 nurses. Uh, so we've got the plans to ensure that our NHS is fit for the future and we'll go on with delivering them. Richard Leonard. Well, the answer to the question I put to the First Minister, which she refused to give, because she either did not know it or did not want to admit it, is £1.1 billion. That's £1.1 billion worth of cuts health boards have had to make since Nicola Sturgeon became First Minister. Today's Audit Scotland report exposes the mismanagement of the NHS under the SNP. Too many staff under too much pressure. Too many patients waiting far too long too many health boards having to make swinging cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Presiding officer, the SNP has been in office for 11 years and the Auditor General has today concluded that the NHS in Scotland is not financially sustainable. That represents nothing less than an abject failure of government, doesn't it? First Minister. Richard Leonard, in his first question to me, asked me if I uh, thought Audit Scotland was wrong. I, I don't think Audit Scotland was wrong. I've made the point uh, that it doesn't take full account of our latest uh, financial plan published just before the October recess. But I think I could uh, equally posit that question to Richard Leonard. Let me read uh, from page 10 of the Audit Scotland report. There has been a 7.7% real terms increase in total health spending in the last decade. So if Richard Leonard is coming here to say, actually, that's not true, there's been cuts to the health budget, is he saying Audit Scotland is wrong? Because, frankly, he must be. So he should try and have a bit of consistency in his uh, questioning. Uh, let me set out the record of this government. Yes, the NHS is under pressure. Rising demand is putting pressure on uh, waiting times. The vast majority of people, though, are seen uh, within the waiting times targets. The Health Secretary set out a plan uh, just uh, earlier this week uh, showing how we will deliver significant improvements uh, to performance in waiting times. Interestingly, you know, if we look at uh, the number of people waiting more than 12 weeks for treatment uh, in the last full year we've got figures for, which is too high, uh, I hasten to add, of just over 80,000. Uh, if we go back to the last year before we came into power when Labour uh, were in office, there were 104,867 oh. waiting more than 12 weeks for treatment. 
So we have the plans in place to protect our health service, record numbers of staff, record funding, even more funding planned, because uh, we have the solutions while Richard Leonard only wants to talk about the problems. Quite a, a lot of interest in asking uh, supplementaries at this stage. The first from Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister is already aware of the horrific situation my constituents David and Karen Con Connolly find themselves in with Mrs Connolly's application to become a British citizen rejected by the Home Office despite her husband of 32 years being a British citizen. The couple moved from Zimbabwe via Botswana to be with their son Marcus, also a British citizen, living for 10 years in Inverurie. And Mrs Connolly is also the carer of her engineer husband, who's quadriplegic and requires 24-hour care. I have written in support of their case ahead of their appeal tribunal and to the First Minister. Can I ask the First Minister what more can we do to support the family and make the case for Mrs Connolly being allowed to remain in Scotland with her family? Yeah, 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 yeah. First Minister. Well, can I thank Gillian Martin for raising this case? I've read the details about Mr and Mrs Connolly's case uh, in the Daily Record this morning and I want to commend uh, Gillian Martin for taking up this case and arguing it so strongly. Uh, my heart goes out to Mr and Mrs Connolly and I hope they get the opportunity to stay here as a family uh, in Scotland. Uh, I have complete sympathy for anybody uh, attempting to navigate the increasingly complex and restrictive UK immigration system. Uh, the one-size-fits-all approach imposed by Westminster is arbitrary and it is very often inhuman, particularly in cases which threaten to rip families apart. You know, literally every day just now we hear more and more stories of lives being disrupted across the country by these disastrous policies. Uh, we want to welcome people to come and live here and to contribute to our community and not to threaten to force them to leave once they settle. Uh, so if there is more that the Scottish Government can do to help Gillian Martin uh, argue this case, I'm more than happy to look at that uh, and see uh, that we do it. But I want to take the opportunity to wish uh, Mr and Mrs Connolly well and give them the message that the vast majority of people in Scotland uh, welcome them here and want them to stay in our country. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how many patients NHS Grampian discharge before a necessary care plan is put in place? First Minister. I'm happy to have the Health Secretary write to the member with the, the detail he's looking for. I don't have that detail to hand. Uh, nobody should be uh, discharged before it is safe for them to be discharged and where the necessary uh, care plans are in place. I know that all health boards and increasingly, of course, integrated joint boards work uh, very hard to make sure that that is the case. And uh, as we've seen over the last few years, uh, overall, the number of uh, delayed discharges uh, are coming down and we have health services and social care services working more closely together to make sure people have the care plans they need. But in terms of specific uh, detail, I'll make sure that's provided to the member. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In recent days, the use of uh, recreational firearms has been in the press, from the shooting of goats uh, through to my constituency, where there is concern about the opening of a gun shop, a mere matter of yards from South Morningside Primary School. Having been in touch with the police, they can take no action because their locus is over who can be a firearms dealer, not where those businesses locate. The council has no locus because it's the police that regulate firearms and indeed on that basis they would have more interest if someone was seeking to open a fast food joint rather than a gun shop. So can I ask the First Minister this, does she believe that a gun shop is just another shop? Does she believe, as I do, that this apparent loophole should be closed whereby we, where we, I think we should have regulation of not just who can operate this, these businesses but where they operate? And finally. Does she believe that it is right to have a gun shop next to a primary school? Because I know I don't. First Minister. Uh, can I thank the member for raising this issue? I, I don't know the particular details of, of the, the shop that he is raising today, but in general terms, I would agree with him that that is not something that I would feel instinctively uh, comfortable with, so I can understand his concerns. I also agree with him that we shouldn't uh, see gun shops as just the same as all other shops for very obvious reasons. Um, as the member is aware, most firearms legislation, uh, with the exception of air weapons, is reserved to Westminster, although we are the only part of uh, Great Britain to license uh, air weapons and firearms licenses are issued by 
Police Scotland. Uh, I am more than happy to look into the particular case uh, that Daniel Johnson is raising and to come back to him if I think there is more action that the Scottish Government or uh, any of our agencies should be taking. But I would also encourage him to raise his concerns if he hasn't already done so with Police Scotland. Um, and I am more than happy to come back to him because I absolutely understand uh, the reasons for uh, what he has described today causing uh, deep disquiet and uh, I'm sure many people will too. Alistair Allen. The First Minister will be aware that Eastern Airways recently cancelled their Stornoway to Aberdeen service with effect from tomorrow. What more can the Scottish Government and its agencies do to ensure the economic viability of air services to and from the Western Isles, uh, particularly for those of my constituents who work in the oil and gas sectors? First Minister. Uh, well, I can understand Alistair Allen's uh, concerns about this. We have to make sure that the connectivity between uh, our islands, all of our islands, uh, including Alistair Allen's constituency in the mainland, uh, are encouraging uh, economic sustainability and sustainability in a range of other ways as well. I'm happy to ask the uh, Transport Secretary to engage with him, to engage uh, with the airline and to look to see whether there's more the Scottish Government can and should be doing uh, to address this particular concern. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In Glasgow on Saturday, thousands of teachers will be taking to the streets to make clear their demand for fair pay settlement. They've already told the government that they will not have their members divided against one another, with some given a decent rise and others left behind. The loss of 3,500 teachers since 2007 and the reliance on temporary contracts for so many newly recruited teachers is having a direct impact on the quality of education. It means more stress in classrooms and staff rooms, more teachers who don't have the permanence that lets them build a strong relationship with their pupils, music lessons axed, children going out without additional needs being identified or met. Will the First Minister promise the teachers who will be marching on Saturday that the government will give them the fair pay rise that's due so that we can attract and retain the teachers our children need. First Minister. First of all, we are committed uh, to fair pay rises for all of our public sector workers where we have already agreed uh, deals. I think we have demonstrated that both for Agenda for Change workers in our National Health Service uh, where we've uh, awarded the best pay rise of any, of any country in the uh, UK as far as I'm aware and also uh, for our police officers where uh, the pay rise for our police officers goes beyond that being offered uh, south of the border. In terms of uh, teachers, uh, yes the teaching unions have formally rejected the latest offer from COSLA, but we're all committed to continuing uh, discussions. Uh, the Scottish Government, of course, is actively involved in these uh, negotiations and uh, would urge everyone around the table to take a constructive approach. Uh, we had worked with COSLA to put in place a fair pay offer for 2018-19, uh, which will see, would see the Scottish Government contributing an additional £35 million of funding for teachers' pay, um, and that would result in all teachers on the main grade scale receiving at least a 5% increase, with some teachers receiving up to 11% in one year. So uh, I do believe that is a generous and fair offer, uh, and hope that it will be considered in such a way, but we are committed to continuing uh, negotiations in good faith. Uh, lastly, in terms of the, the point about parity, I absolutely understand and sympathise with that point. And we value the whole education workforce and recognise the aspiration for parity between teachers and non-teachers. I simply point out that these involve two different negotiating arrangements. The Scottish Government is party to the teachers' pay negotiating uh, mechanisms, whereas pay for non-teachers is negotiated between COSLA and the trade unions, and we are not part of that process. So these are two different mechanisms, but of course that doesn't take away from uh, the fact that we have sympathy with the overall point uh, made. We want to have pay and other arrangements in place that attract people into teaching uh, and give them a rewarding career when they're in it. Patrick Harvey. Well, parity even within the teaching workforce doesn't yet seem to be acknowledged. And the teachers who will be marching on Saturday are saying that all teachers deserve that 10% rise. It's necessary in order to make up for the years of below inflation, real terms pay cuts. And the consequence of getting this wrong won't just be unhappy teachers, perhaps even forced to the point of industrial action. Holding back teachers' pay and squeezing the budgets of our local councils will prevent the educational improvements that I do believe the First Minister wants to see. 
And it's not only our teachers and schools, the councils which fund them need the resources to do the job properly and to do everything else we expect of them from social care to environmental services. If we want the excellent public services this country deserves, we need to make the resources available. When will this government finally give councils both the funding and the powers they need and deserve? First Minister. Well, of course, in our, our last budget, we agreed with the Green Party a deal for councils that delivered real terms increases in the budget uh, that they have to spend. Of course, we were also the first government anywhere in the UK to lift the 1% public sector pay cap. In terms of that point about parity within the teaching profession, and I'm not going to comment specifically on teachers uh, on this because the, the negotiations are ongoing, but generally uh, within our public sector pay policy, and I, I think this has been backed by the Greens and others, we've recognised the need to give uh, bigger pay increases to those at the lower end of the scale than those at the higher end of the scale. And I actually believe in that progressive principle uh, and it's one that I, I thought uh, Patrick Harvey uh, agreed with as well. Now in terms of uh, pay deals we have we, we absolutely recognize uh, that public sector workers have taken a lot of pain uh, through pay restraint in recent years and we are committed and I've made this very clear as has the finance secretary uh, to redressing that uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, we've got to do that in a way that is fair but it stands to reason we've also got to do that in a way that is affordable and I think we've demonstrated our commitment to this the nine percent over three years that has been agreed for nurses and other agenda for change workers the uh, six and a half percent over the 30 months for our police officers uh, that strikes a balance between fairness and recognizing that we have ground to make up for public sector workers but also recognizing that we have to have deals that are affordable i hope we can reach the same fair uh, outcome for teachers because we all want to see teachers properly rewarded for the excellent job that they do uh, for their sake but also so we can continue to attract new people into the profession in the years to come Question number four, Willie Rennie. Can I take the First Minister back to the NHS? She talked earlier about her plan to meet waiting times targets that she has failed to meet so far. On page four of that plan, it says that performance will continue to decline. The next quarter's figures will be worse than the last quarter. And those were worse than the ones before that and the ones before that too. Why is, is it in year 12 of an SNP government that we still have to expect waiting times to get worse before there is any sign of them getting better. First Minister. Well, I think the answer to that is pretty well known uh, to Willie Rennie and to others. Firstly, let me repeat what I said to Richard Leonard. The vast majority of uh, patients are seen within our waiting times targets. And of course, one of the observations made in the Audit Scotland report today is that 90% of patients rate their care as good or excellent. And I think that's a tribute to the NHS and all of the staff across the country who work in it. But demand on our NHS is rising. That is largely because of the ageing profile of our population. And that is putting enormous pressure uh, on waiting time. So what the Health Secretary did this week was be utterly transparent about those challenges, uh, the impact they are having right now, and what the funded plans are that we have in place uh, to address those challenges and to substantially and sustainably reduce waiting times. I think that's the right way to go. And I actually, although it gives uh, Willie Rennie the opportunity to come and ask these questions today, I think it is important and right for us to be fully frank, honest and transparent with Parliament about the nature and scale of the challenge uh, that we are facing so that Parliament can then hold us to account as we work through this plan in the years ahead. So I will continue uh, working with the Health Secretary to make sure that we have the funding in place, to make sure we're putting the staff resources in place and to make sure we have the reform plans in place uh, to ensure that our NHS is fit for the future. Uh, that's uh, my responsibility uh, and it's one that I'll continue to live up to. Willie Rennie. But the law states that patients will be guaranteed NHS treatment within 12 weeks. This is the First Minister's law from when she was Health Secretary. It was an SNP flagship law that helped them take power in 2007. And it's a law that the SNP government has broken over 100,000 times. But on Tuesday, the government said they'd keep on breaking the law for another three years. If a member of the public was to break the law this many times, they'd serve time in Berlin. Why is it that when the SNP government breaks the law, they think they can get away scot-free? 
So can the First Minister tell the people of Scotland what exactly are the penalties for breaking this law that she has flouted so many times? First Minister. He always kind of manages to let himself down on, on these serious issues. Uh, but can I return to the, the serious point? Because, the, the, well, I'm, I'm trying to answer it. The 12-week treatment guarantee, yes, it has uh, not been adhered to more than 100,000 times, uh, but 1.6 million patients have been treated within that, patients that might have waited over uh, 12 uh, weeks without that guarantee. And as I just said, there are now fewer people waiting more than 12 weeks for treatment than, was, than were the case when this government came uh, to office. Uh, the uh, sanctions and the steps that are taken when health boards don't meet uh, the treatment time guarantee are actually laid down in the law. So Willie Rennie can go like anybody else uh, and look at what they are. Uh, the health secretary engages with health boards. Health boards have obligations uh, to advise and inform patients of what they will do uh, to deliver the treatment as uh, quickly as possible and health boards are, uh, are monitored on that by the health secretary. So I do not, I stand here today and do not shy away from the challenges that our health service in common with health services uh, across the UK and further afield are facing. Uh, but we are putting in place the plans, we have put in place the plans, both around investment and around reform uh, to make sure that we meet those targets uh, and to make sure that the quality of care is as patients expect. And the final point, presiding officer, again going back to the Audit Scotland report, the Audit Scotland report, uh, a point repeated by the Auditor General on ra radio this morning, is very clear about the high quality of care delivered by staff in our NHS and that is something we should thank them for. There's still a lot of interest in asking supplementaries. We'll take a number. First from Mark Ruskell. Thank you. The science is clear. We've just 12 years, three parliamentary sessions left to avoid dangerous climate breakdown. This week, our Environment Committee heard direct from the IPCC that all climate targets need to be reconsidered. Can the First Minister explain why the Scottish Government has, alongside the UK Tory Government, asked their advisers to only look at whether changes are required to the long-term climate target and not the need to increase ambition between now and 2032? First Minister. Well, actually, we have specifically asked them for the shorter uh, term as well. So in that respect, I'm being told by the Environment Secretary, uh, I will be corrected if I'm getting that wrong, that that is the case. We, of course, in terms of the shorter term targets, if you look at 2020 and 2030, uh, the targets set out in the bill that's currently before Parliament are already the most stretching targets anywhere in the world. Uh, but in terms of the IPCC report, which we take extremely seriously, the central recommendation in the IPCC report is that the world should reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, the bill that's currently before Parliament delivers that for Scotland. We'd already passed, well past peak emissions, which is the other uh, point the IPCC report makes about the world needing to get to peak emissions uh, imminently. Uh, so the bill does that. In terms of the aspiration that many have, that I share, to go to net zero for all emissions as quickly as possible. Uh, we've asked the uh, Committee on Climate Change to give us updated advice because its existing advice says that the 90% by 2050 in the bill is already at the limit of feasibility. But of course, the bill uh, puts obligations on ministers to review these targets to get to that net zero as quickly as possible. So uh, we are recognised internationally uh, as a world leader and my determination is that we stay uh, at the leading edge of world action to tackle climate change for the benefit of this and perhaps even more importantly, future generations. Tom Arthur. Can I ask the First Minister for her response to comments made in this chamber yesterday that people reliant upon social security including those receiving in-work benefits, have no right to have more than two children. First Minister. Well, I think the uh, comments that were made by Michelle Ballantyne in this chamber yesterday were both appalling and also uh, ignorant of uh, the reality <laughs> facing many families. Um, Appalling because the idea that being poor should be a barrier to having a family uh, is Dickensian uh, and I think shows the Scottish Conservatives in their true colours. Uh, but the comments were also ignorant because, of course, the rape clause uh, will and won't just apply uh, when children are first born. From next year, it will apply to children of any age should their family circumstances change uh, so that they need to claim 
uh, benefits to defend the rate clause and misses the point that any of us can have our circumstances change at any time. And what Michelle Ballantyne seems to be suggesting is that if that happens to a family who perhaps had three children while they were all in work, uh, suddenly fall into different circumstances, uh, those children should be penalised as a result. It is absolutely shameful. The social security safety net is there for all of us should we need it. Uh, in times of uh, distress or, or times of changed circumstances and frankly shame uh, on the Conservatives that they are dismantling that social security safety net. Jackie Bailey. The First Minister will be aware that there are workers hired to build the flagship £2.6 billion Beatrice offshore wind farm that have included migrants without immigration documents, paid a fraction of the minimum wage, some under £5 an hour. The Scottish Government believes that green energy is a priority. So will the First Minister act to ensure that green jobs are not exploited jobs and stop this from happening to major infrastructure projects in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, I would unreservedly condemn any employer that was exploiting uh, workers in that way. I, I'm happy to ask uh, the Economy Secretary and the Infrastructure Secretary to look into this specific case uh, and to uh, give Jackie Bailey uh, the findings of that uh, when they've had the chance to do so. But the expectation of me as First Minister, the expectation uh, of this Scottish Government is that uh, employers uh, have fair work policies. In fact, we announced over uh, the course of the recess plans uh, to toughen up uh, our approach to fair work, uh, both in terms of uh, our expectations uh, when government grants are granted or in the public procurement system. And of course, we'll set out more details of that to Parliament in due course. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. Despite receiving an influenza vaccine, one of my constituents developed pneumonia requiring a full day admission to the Borders General Hospital. The First Minister will be aware that in Scotland, the new flu jab is only avail available to over 75s. And last year, influenza and pneumonia deaths hit an 18 year high. With a cold snap predicted, is the First Minister confident that under 75s are properly protected and the NHS has the correct resources it needs to prevent further deaths? First Minister. Uh, yes, I am confident in our vaccination uh, programme and I think all of us as responsible members of this parliament should encourage the public to be confident in that vaccination uh, programme as uh, well. Uh, the supply of uh, the vaccine is already available to GPs. The, the programme is already underway. In terms of the, uh, there's a number of different vaccines uh, in use uh, in Scotland for different groups of people. In terms of the over 75s, of course it was uh, the recommendation of the JCVI that if there had to be a prioritisation uh, of that vaccine then it should be over 75s that were in the priority group that's what the Scottish Government has uh, ensured and of course it has been uh, supply issues beyond uh, our control that has meant that in this uh, year we can't extend that to over 65s but we will do that in future years but the other vaccines the vaccine that is being used uh, for the over 65s is an effective vaccine and let me take this opportunity to encourage all those who haven't yet uh, taken up uh, the vaccine and are eligible to do so to do so as quickly as possible it not only protects them it helps to protect the population as a whole question number five christine graham uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the use of daylight saving time. First Minister. I'm aware of the European Commission's proposal to end current daylight saving arrangements. The Scottish Government does not believe there is a substantive economic or social case for any change to these arrangements. The Rural Economy Secretary has this week written to the UK Government to stress that the effect of the proposal, if implemented, would be more pronounced in Scotland, given greater extremes in the extent of our daylight hours. The impact would likely be particularly felt by the farming community and other outdoor workers. Uh, we're currently engaging with stakeholders to better understand the potential impact of this proposal and we will ensure that any concerns raised are reflected in our ongoing discussions with the UK Government. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the First Minister for her answer and Scottish Government's support for putting the clocks back one hour this weekend, which I must remember to do as I didn't do it one year. Can I welcome the letter from the, about the letter of the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy to the UK Government, which sometimes being located so far south fails to recognise how long our winter mornings can be. But can I ask the Cabinet if the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary for Transport will also contact the UK Government on the issue of road traffic accidents and indeed the effect of these dark mornings on the safety of our school children walking to school particularly in rural areas with no pavements and no street lighting, such as in my constituency of the Borders and Midlothian. First Minister. 
Well, I'm tempted to say that the fact that Chris and Graham, due to a lapse of memory these years ago, is uh, one hour out of sync with the rest of us might explain an awful, an awful lot, but uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll pay dearly for that comment in the weeks and months to come. Uh, this is a serious issue. Um, we'll be happy to make the letter from the Rural Economy Secretary uh, available to Parliament and, of course, uh, likewise with any response we receive. As I said in my answer, we're currently gathering views on what the impact of the proposed change would be, and that will include uh, the impact on transport and other areas highlighted by Christine Graham. Uh, the Commission has stated in its own proposals that the evidence is currently inconclusive in terms of road safety. So we will continue uh, to liaise with the UK Government. This is a reserved uh, matter. Uh, with the transport sector and rural communities on this important issue and if there are issues that the transport secretary requires also to raise uh, he will certainly do so and apologies for going over time but question six thank you presiding officer to ask the first minister what the scottish government's position is on the report from chest heart and stroke scotland which suggests that one in five patients are not receiving the support they require first minister we welcome Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland's report and will continue to work alongside them to support people living with and affected by these conditions. Our plans to improve rehabilitation are set out in our Stroke and Heart Disease Improvement Plans. We're working in partnership with NHS boards, the voluntary sector and a range of providers across health and social care to help ensure people who have heart disease or have had a stroke get access to the care and support they need to help them return to independent living. Our strategy for tackling strokes and heart disease is delivering improvements with mortality rates reducing by around 40% for both stroke and coronary heart disease over the past 10 years. Uh, pulmonary rehabilitation is already a key recommendation in our national clinical guidelines. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. What assurances can the Scottish Government give that it will do all it can to end existing variations in access to NHS rehabilitation services, as well as do provide allied health professionals when pulmonary rehabilitation is already within clinical guidelines, yet an estimated 60,000 people are not currently receiving it? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, uh, can I say again that we welcome this report by Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland and I want to take the opportunity today to commend them for the work that they do. The Health Secretary uh, recently met uh, with them to begin discussions with them on their campaign and she has given them a commitment, and I'll repeat that commitment today, uh, to continue these discussions to see how we can move towards the right to rehab uh, end result that CHSS are uh, looking for. Uh, we, as I say, already have uh, plans to improve re rehabilitation in place through the stroke and heart disease improvement uh, plans. Uh, these include priorities on rehab, transition to the community and supported self-management to support uh, people living uh, longer, healthier lives in their own uh, communities. Uh, our stroke improvement team and the cardiac rehabilitation uh, champion are working across health and social care with the third sector as well to help us deliver uh, on these priorities. So we will continue to uh, take forward uh, our existing proposals and any enhanced proposals that are required as a result of our discussions with Chess Heart and Stroke Scotland. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes First Minister's questions. We're now going to move on to members' business in the name of Jamie Halcrow Johnson. But before we do, we're going to have a short suspension simply to allow the public gallery to uh, clear and our guests for the next debate to arrive. A short suspension. <laughs>